I have just released uh, homework number three, uh, which will be due uh, check October one, Thursday, October one. Do you are October one. Thank you. Um, homework, uh, sorry, project two. Uh, so this will be a good time for me to answer any question regarding uh, project two. Okay. So if you have any question regarding the implementation of project two, <coughs> feel free to ask me right now. Or you can post question to uh, the discussion forum we have. Yes. So just to make sure, are you expecting us to? Uh, uh, resize our cache table when they, whenever whenever the load becomes too big. Uh, <coughs> you don't have to, because in the test cases we have, uh, the the particular case you mentioned will never happen. Uh, so you don't have to uh, worry about that. But if you want to do that and uh, clean your hash table, yes. Wait, how come it won't happen? Sorry. You said it won't happen. happen. Yeah, I won't. Ha I don't think that will happen in our test cases. Oh, yeah. So, so that's a general, you know, related to uh, Daniel's question. Basically, uh, for all the projects we have, we expect you to pass all the test cases we have distributed, and we will not do additional uh, test cases. Uh, this is to uh, make sure we are fair to all the students. Uh, as long as you code can pass all the test cases we have given out, then we consider you have uh, score all the credits. Uh, of course, in practice, even though your code has passed all the test cases we have given out, that doesn't necessarily mean your code is uh, bug free, right? You all know that. But just to be fair, uh, we will not do additional uh, test cases uh, when grading your product. Okay? Yes? Well, the part of the reason I was asking is there was a statement where you say, like, uh, we don't want to see linear time or like, <laughs> see your data structures. Well, the, <coughs> the point is, if you use a hash table to implement uh, Project 2, you will not spend linear time in looking up which frame is holding which page ID. If you do not have a hash table, uh, on the other hand, uh, you can still find out which frame is holding uh, which page ID by simply linear scan uh, all the buffer frames. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that will cost you linear time. That's something we don't want you to do. Right, that's why you need to use a hash table to look up uh, the location of a particular page where it is in your buffer frame. But so does that also apply for the queue structure? So like if you implement like a priority queue, like it's okay to have linear time somewhere. Well, for the queue, for the lab and heap queue, right? So in this particular uh, product, in your frame structure, and in, uh, as part of your hash table entry structure, you will <coughs> remember if if the current frame is in your Love of EQ, you will remember the location of of this frame in the queue. If you if you implement, for example, if you implement this queue at the at the linear list structure, then you can from that frame you can jump to the location uh, of with uh, using a pointer without traversing the list from the very beginning. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, that makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Fantastic. Any other question you have? So some students uh, asked a number of questions uh, on the course website regarding, uh, the first one I think, uh, it was regarding the uh, disk contractor in C++. Uh, just remember, <coughs> the disk contractor in C++ works as follows. When you uh, call the disk structure of a class, right, it will automatically call the disk structure of its member variables. Does that make sense to you? If, if your member variable is a class, is another class by itself, the destructure of the current class will call those destructure automatically. So you do not have to worry about freeing those space of those classes because the destructure itself will take care of that. Okay, that's observation number two. Observation number two, the order that they call these destructors is from, if you look at your .h file from your uh, uh, class, right, it starts from the last member variable you had declared and go backwards. Does that make sense to you? 
So go backwards. You start from the last member variable and go backwards. That's the order they will call these structures one by one on your member variables. Of course, <laughs> if it's if your member variable is not a class object and you use free in your current class to dynamically allocate some memory space, then you need to uh, use delete to free those dynamically allocated space. For every new, you need to use delete to free the memory space in your destructor. However, even if you don't use delete for a new uh, statement uh, that you have in your implementation, most in most cases, it might not cause you a problem because, yes, it is a memory leak, but unless you do extensive uh, running of your system, uh, those memory leaks might not come back and haunt you. You might still be able to pass our test cases, but in a real system, if, <coughs> if you leave that in your implementation, eventually your system will run into problems. Make sense to you? Okay, any other questions you may have? And the, the, same student also asked about the free page <coughs> uh, uh, implementation. So let me remind you again, when you ask questions on that forum, do not post your source code. Because when you post your source code, others, everyone can see your source code. Literally, you are, you are, you are making everyone uh, run you the risk of plagiarism, right? as soon as you do that. Rather, what you should do is to list the logic of your implementation. You say, okay, this is what I have done in my free page implementation. I first do this and then do that. That's okay. Or use some kind of pseudo code to demonstrate your idea when you ask for help. Never ever show your source code. The student subsequently deleted the source code, which is fine, but I replied to him anyway. But in the, in the future, just keep that in mind when you post questions on that forum because that's a public forum everyone can see. You should not. You do not want to post your source code over there. Is that clear? Okay. Any other <laughs> question you may have? So, if a page is initially <laughs> marked as deleted, and then some other thread marked it or marked the page as loved, so does that mean that it would be removed from the AMQ and then placed in the loved queue? Uh, yes. I think yes. Okay. So, so there, you yeah. would never have a page in both queues at the same time, right? No. No. Well, I'm not sure. Let me check the. Let me, let me double check on this. Check <laughs> the description of the other key policies. Others can comment on this as well if you know the other I just need to refresh my memory on the love and key policy. Oh, you cannot see this? And some of you asked me about the midterm test, uh, the time of the midterm test. I mentioned this before. So let me just emphasize this again. The midterm will be the last lecture right before the spring break. Okay? The last lecture right before spring break. So it's Thursday. Oh, huh? oh sorry, fall break. I always think about spring break <laughs> for some reason. Okay. So the last lecture right before <coughs> fall break. So it's a Thursday. October Yeah. In 
in this case, assume that love conquers the light. Okay? Meaning that once a page is indicated love, it should remain love. Which means you will, as soon as it's indicated as being loved, if it's in the KQ currently, you want to remove that from KQ and put, place that page into the love queue. So that would mean that, like, so if for whatever reason a thread marked as, uh, mark the page as love, and then for some reason it changes its mind, it, it changes its mindset, it should be hated. <laughs> well, then you jump back to the thief queue, right? I guess. Yeah. The point is, if a page is being loved and hated at the same time, love dominates hate. Uh, so, so love always has has a higher priority in this sense. Okay. okay. Any other questions you may have? Those are good questions. Others? You good with the UE implementation? By the way, another reminder: the due date is noon, right? It's not midnight. Uh, I actually uh, talk about this uh, in one of the lectures because I said midnight deadline uh, is really hard for us because we have to stay up until midnight to close the submission site. That's why. We always do submission during the day, right? So the deadline is noon instead of midnight. Some of you um, miss that for the first product, uh, which I'm going to give some a break for you, give a break for you because this is the first time you do this, but uh, subject to a small penalty, which we can discuss offline, right? If that applies to you, you should definitely talk to me. Uh, I think at least two students uh, made that mistake for product one submission. Uh, so you should definitely talk to me uh, if that applies to you, okay? But for all subsequent submissions, keep in mind it's always due at noon, 12 p.m., not 12 a.m., okay? <laughs> and the project three will be due after the project three will be due after the break or? Uh, project three will be due after the break. Yes, that's right. Uh, project three actually is one of the hardest uh, projects, not all the ones you're gonna implement. So I will definitely give you sufficient amount of time to make sure you can finish it. So four break is a good time to, to work on it. Okay. So four break, the reason they call four break, they don't call it four holiday, right? <laughs> it's a break for you to catch up with your homework and project, right? It's not a break for you to, to go enjoy you know, the break, right? So, so the reason they call it four break rather than four holiday, right? Okay. Yeah, this is a kind of weird. Some of you <coughs> mentioned to me or the TA that you had trouble you using the web hanging interface. I tested myself uh, whenever I got such a complaint and it always worked for me. So I don't know, it could be a browser specific problem related with the particular browser you are using. So all could be the Kate machine has a glitch at a particular time period, uh, which uh, was not there when I uh, was testing it. But for most of you, you submitted OK, and the command line approach always works. So if the web hanging for some reason uh, doesn't work for you, go the other way. And uh, uh, if both break, then talk to one of us. But do not try to email your submission to us because that will create a lot of emails for us and we have to download and uh, place your submission into the repository and in the process of doing that, we may miss your submission, right? So, uh, which is not something you want. So always use Hanyin and if Hanyin for some reason doesn't work for you, contact us immediately, okay? But one of them should work unless the entire kit machine is done, right? Which is very unlikely, okay? Yeah, that's another thing some of you mentioned, like, how do I verify my submission is, is successful, right? So, generally, if you go through the process and without any glitch, it should be there, right? But if you just want to make sure, you can email one of the TAs and they can verify for you on the server side. If you do uh, hand in project number, uh, class number, project number, it'll show you the submission that you've done. On there, okay. And it'll cool. tell you the size, so check that the size is the same and check that it's there. So don't, don't specify about that and it'll tell you. All right, thanks, Victor. So that's a good uh, 
comment, right? Basically, if you use the command line approach, uh, that will give you a, a, a way to verify what's going on. Okay. Any other question regarding Project Two before I move on to uh, the, the new discussion in our lecture? So everything is good? Or oh, you haven't started yet? So let me warn you, right? Project one is relatively easy. And Project two is, is uh, definitely much harder than Project one. So you want to start early, right? And uh, uh, get it out in time. And Project three is, is much, much harder than both Project one and Project two. Right? That's why I'm giving you the uh, four bricks to work on. <laughs> Okay, all right, let's move on to lecture. <coughs> uh, to just give you an idea of what homework three looks like. Uh, <coughs> so the plan for us is to uh, cover all the things needed to uh, for you to do homework three, and your midterm essentially will cover all the materials covered by uh, homeworks one, two, three. Okay, and I will do one more quiz right before the midterm, uh, and after homework three is due to test the content covered by homework three. So that will give you another uh, uh, venue to uh, check yourself on your understanding of this part. Then we are all set for uh, doing the midterm test. A midterm, I remind you again, it's open book, which means you can reference to homeworks one, two, three, and their solutions, quiz one, two, and the solutions, and all the lecture slides. Okay, so so that will be uh, what's covering the midterm. Okay. Now, uh, talking about <coughs> this particular homework, homework uh, problem one is on um, you understanding is testing you understanding on disk. And problem two uh, is a simple problem on buffer management, okay? buffer replacement, different buffer replacement policies. And for that, uh, problem three is a quick test on your understanding of various ways of organizing your file, with potentially with an indexing structure. And then for that, uh, problem four uh, goes into the detail of that and asks you about the query cost of different operations using different ways of organizing your files, with or without an indexing structure. Okay, that's essentially uh, the scope of this homework. Okay? And we have covered uh, more than half of what's needed here, but we, we are still uh, short of the discussion for uh, indexing structure, which we will start today. All right. So let's look at uh, index structure. <coughs> so we start uh, right here after we have filled in these two columns. Right? Uh, a reminder for you is not to memorize uh, these formulas up here. Rather, you want to understand uh, what is going on here. For example, uh, the cost of insertion for and an deletion for a, a sorted file is is this, the reason for that is we assume that in a sorted file we actually compact uh, uh, all the records within and across different pages. Uh, that's a critical assumption for you to derive the cost formula like this because otherwise my cost is simply search plus one which is find the page, insert the record and write it back to the disk. But because we assume that the records are compacted uh, are really next to each other, even within and across different pages. When you try to do an insertion, uh, on average, you expect to to uh, touch half number of pages and move the record in those pages backward to create a space necessary to store the new record. And on average, that leads to half <laughs> number of pages being uh, read into the memory and written back to disk. So that gives you. 0 0.5b times 2, which gives you b, uh, I hope, in total. So the, the rhythm behind 
the formula, right? You cannot just memorize the formula because if I change the assumption I have made, then the game is different, right? The game is different. Okay. So now let's try to fill the rest of the column, like un uh, classifier and unclassifier and uh, and so, uh, a hash index structure. Well, for that purpose, we need to understand what is uh, index. What is the index? Well, index. Uh, in general, is is just a data structure that allow you to do quick retrieval of data from 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 your file, from your database file, right? So, for example, <coughs> oftentimes we have queries like this. We want to find all students in the CS department, find all students with a GPA greater than three. So, in the first example, is an equality search on the department name. <coughs> the second example is a range search on the GPA field. Right. So an index basically is a D-space data structure uh, that's built upon your search key uh, to facilitate the retrieval of records using the search key field. The search key, as I reminded you before, has nothing to do with the key of the schema. Rather, it's just a user's choice of one or multiple uh, fields from a given schema to build your indexing structure over. Okay? For example, if you have an index on the department name, then your search key is department name. If you have an index on GPA value, then your search key for that second index is simply the GPA field. Okay? Has nothing to do with the key of your schema. Okay? <coughs> now <laughs> An index contains a collection of data entries. And the data entry, in general, we denote a data entry as as follows, as okay, as a third key value k and some structure we denote as heuristic. Okay? This is a search key value. Okay? And this heuristic is you know, some structure that will be clear in, that we will that we will talk about in a minute, right? That we will talk about in a minute. Uh, so <laughs> let's look at the first one. This is easy to understand, right? This K simply denotes a value from your search key field. A value from your search key field. Right? For example, K could be uh, CS. If your search key is department name. Okay? K will also be 3.0 if your search key is JPA. You follow me? Okay. And what is, so all it matters is what is a risk right? A risk is a structure, is a succinct, concise structure that allows you to look up a record with the given search key value k. It's a succinct, concise structure that allows you to retrieve the record with this, this particular search key value k. You follow me? So that's what a risk take is. That means that this thing can be a RID value itself, because that definitely allows you to retrieve the record uh, effectively. Once you know the RID, you can retrieve the record. Of course, it's not any random RID. It is a RID that corresponds to a record with the search key value k. You follow me? So this RID will respond to a record where that's the search key field of this record and, and this happened to be K. And there are some other values for the other attributes I do not care. But the search key field must be of, of value K in order for this K and RID to be in the same data entry. Is that clear? Okay, so that's one. <coughs> Possible choice. <coughs> what is another possible choice? 
for arithmetic. Well, it is a structure that allows you to retrieve records with the third key value k, right? So instead of a single record ID, I could also use a set of RIDs because why? Because uh, many records may share the same third key value of k. That's not the case if your third key value is department name because department name more than likely will be distinct. For well, one university, you're not, you're not gonna have two CS departments. But if your third key value is, let's say, GPA value, then it's definitely possible to have multiple student records with a third key value equal to 3.0. They just happen to have the same GPA value equal to 3.0. So in that case, I may use a list of RIDs such that each RID corresponds to a distinct record that has the search key value k. You follow me? What about the last possible option? Well, the last possible option, remember, <coughs> we say arithmetic is really a structure allow, that allows you to retrieve the record with the search key value k. So I can use RID, I can use a list of RIDs. I could also use the record itself. Because if my heuristic is the record itself, yes, it does give me a way to retrieve the record, right? obviously. So this could be the record itself. OK, so those are the three possible alternatives for uh, heuristic. But always keep in mind, in all three options, it must be a record with a search key value k. record with search key value k in order for this heuristic to be together with uh, this search key value k in the same data entry. You follow me? Okay. That being said, okay, you can essentially, essentially that's what, uh, what I have here of k heuristic. Okay? So I'm going to skip the discussion here and come back to this. Uh, the index classification example, the example on B tree, and to show you the uh, the slides, we talk about these three different alternatives. Then we come back uh, to see some examples of index structure in the database. <coughs> so you have seen this. That's essentially the same discussion I have. So in the in the slides, we actually use a different order uh, from what I have used. So this is the actually option one, which is the actual record itself. The second is the record of, so this is my second option, this is the third option, right? To be consistent with the slide, to be consistent with the slide. Okay? So that being said, what we are, <coughs> what we're going to do next is to compare <coughs> the difference, <coughs> uh, the difference among these three different alternatives, right? And to, to make, to try to make a case which one you want to use in practice, okay? So, the first observation we're going to make is that in a database, if you try to build an indexing structure, the indexing structure is always built over a collection of data entries. A collection of data entries, okay? Rather than the records themselves. Rather than the records themselves. That being said, uh, one thing uh, we want to make it clear is that each record will correspond to one data entry each record will correspond to one data entry. If you are going to build an indexing structure over uh, your database file, then every record in the file will correspond to at least one data entry. Okay? Let's go through these choices one by one, right? First of all, if you go with alternative one as your uh, data entry, then in this particular case, in this particular case, your record itself is viewed as your data entry. You follow me? Because why? Because the structure is this, right? If we go with alternative one, then this is record itself. 
there is no point for you to duplicate the record and making a data entry for it. You just take the record as you did it. You just view the record as you did it. And you may wonder, what about this <laughs> value k? Well, you just treat the third key field from that record as you uh, the value of k in your data entry. Do you follow me? So suppose this is the record, right? And that's your search key field, value k, and there are a bunch of other stuff. <coughs> so I simply view this as my search value k, and this whole thing as my reason. That's my alternative one. Do you follow me now? OK, so that's alternative one. Yeah. Sorry, do you make a copy of the table, like the entries in the table, and they can be duplicated in the index? If you use alternative one, the answer is no. You will not duplicate the record out to a separate data entry. The reason is uh, there's really no incentive for you to do that. If you data entry in the record itself, mm -hmm. so you don't want to duplicate that. So you have like some kind of pointer. Well, you simply view the records themselves as the collection of your data entries and oh, view okay. index over them directly. What if you want to index over to search? Uh, I will come to that in a minute, but that's a very good question. So Monty asked, what about if you have index over different search key fields? Okay. The, the, the quick answer to his question is that it is definitely possible to have multiple indexes over the same table, and each index is on a different search key field. And how exactly we're going to do that, we will explain that in a minute, uh, after we fully understand uh, the relationship uh, between record and data entries. Yeah? <laughs> All right. So that's alternative one. I think that's clear, right? I want, I want it clear. So if you use alternative one, <coughs> the collection of records you have for this table automatically becomes the collection of data entries you have. Okay? What about alternative? Uh, let's go with alternative three. Alternative three is easier to understand than alternative two. Then we come back to alternative two. Alternative 3 says the search key value k and a single RID. A single RID. So in this case, what can, you, what can you claim about the collection of data entries you have? What can you, what can you say about this uh, data entries? First of all, let me ask this question. Okay? How many data entries are you going to have in, if you're using alternative 3? Equal to the number of records you have. Why? Because I just mentioned every record must correspond to a data entry, and each data entry has only a single RID, so it's a one-to-one -one mapping by these two uh, claims. Which means you're going to have equal number of data entries to uh, the number of records you have. Okay? So if you draw this out uh, to illustrate this, <coughs> So these are my key file pages that you have implemented, you have just implemented in your project one, right? And within each key file page, <coughs> within each key file page is a collection of records. We implement the heap file page, then we jump to the buffer manager. There is, there is actually another component in between, which is the heap file itself, which we have skipped. Which we have skipped. Okay. Now, what are the data entries for me in this case? What are the data entries for me in this case? If I'm using alternative three, what happens is this guy is sitting on your disk, right? These are on this. All these pages are on your disk. And what I'm doing is I'm going to produce one data entry per record. 
according to what Sweda has just argued for us, right? It's a one to one value between backup and data trace. So suppose this is my value k1, value k2, value k3, k4, and so on and so forth. These are all from my third key field. Yep. Yep, here. Oh. So this is k1. It's just some index, right? To denote the different third key values that this record may have from their third key field. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do search key T1, RID of the first record. But <coughs> if I'm drawing this on a pic using a picture, the RID can be viewed as a pointer to the record, right? Because RID, what is RID? Like? Page ID and small number. And effectively, that gives you a way to uh, trace back to the record. And that's essentially, we can understand the ID pointer. So my first data entry is simply this. What about my second data entry? Good morning. And I'm going to have this many data entries, one for each. Well, it's a combination of these values. Just concatenate these values together. 
Yes. Okay, if you have multiple attributes for your third key field, you take all those values out and concatenate them together, that becomes UK. That first name, last name, concatenate it together. That becomes UK. And first name, GPA, that's fine. Right? Fifi, not too far, four far, right? <laughs> okay? All right, so what about alternative two? Well, once you understand alternative one and alternative three, uh, yeah, alternative two uh, becomes uh, quite trivial to understand, right? Well, <coughs> all these things, let's look at this example I just, I just, get, I just used to, uh, in my response to Victor's question. And they have multiple uh, records with the same search key value, which means I'm going to have multiple data entries with the same search key value of three off, right? Well, what's going to happen in alternative two is I'm going to compress all those data entries with the same search key value into a single data entry. Why I want to do that? Because I do not want to store uh, these uh, duplicate search key values multiple times. I only want to store them once. So what's going to happen is this data entry will be gone, and this data entry will be gone, and rather I'm going to have three pointers here. Like that. Okay? And assuming, of course, we only have three records with JPU value equal to 3.0. Okay? Uh, do you follow me? This is alternative three right? Sorry, louder. So what you're talking about now, this one is alternative three right? List of varieties matching. Ah, then yes, yes. So this is alternative two. And what I'm talking about now is also in this way. Yes. List of RIDs. List of RIDs. Yeah. So for this week, uh, the sorted file is something which is... <laughs> sorted file will be, yes. If you have a sorted file to begin with, it will be much easier to use alternative 3 because... Uh, why? Because the uh, end, suppose the sorted file is sorted by your search key field. Otherwise, it's useless. If it is sorted by your search key field, then it is much easier to construct data entry using alternative 3 for a sorted file, the reason is all the records with the same sort key value are guaranteed to be next to each other. You will never have things like this. Rather, these records should have, if it's a sorted file, this record must be like here. And your pointer is going to be like this. And you're not going to have a pointer like this jumping all over the place uh, in, your, uh, in your data file. So in this case, uh, if we don't have sorted file, we need to create the, all of the records well, if you don't have a sorted file, what's going to happen is you're going to produce one data entry per record using alternative two. Sort the data entries. You do not sort the records because sorting the record is going to be much more expensive than sorting the data entries. I don't know whether you guys realize this or not. The reason is even though you have same number of records and same number of data entries, but each data entry is much smaller in size than the record. A record may be 100 megabytes or at least uh, 100 kilobytes or something like that, but a data entry is just a few bytes, right? So a 100 gigabytes file, once you represent them using data entry, become only 100 uh, megabytes. Sorting 100 megabytes obviously going to be much more efficient than sorting 100, 100 gigabytes. So you sort the data entries, then you compact the data entries to alternative three. If you want to do alternative three, that's what you would do. Okay? All right, I think we're uh, clear about alternative one, two, three. Okay, that being said, let's come back and uh, visit. I'll give you a quick brief, a quick. Oh, all right, let's come back and uh, do a quick preview, uh, preview of index structures. So, 
So there are different ways you can classify you, uh, indexing structures. Uh, in the literature, you see a terminology like primary and secondary indexes. And oftentimes, primary and secondary index refer to uh, indexes built on your primary key and non-primary keys. If you have an index over your primary key, that's what we call a primary index. If you have an index over non-primary key attributes, then that's called a secondary index. Uh, there's another really important concept called clustered versus unclustered index, uh, which goes into uh, the definition of cluster file and unclustered file, uh, which we will talk about in a minute. Then we have single key versus composite key indexes, which is what Sweda has asked. Whether you search key field is a single attribute or a multiple attributes. Okay. Tree based and hash based index structures. So those are different classifications. Let's look at a tree based indexing structure, which we will talk about in details uh, after we finish the discussion right here. So this is a B plus three index structure. So <laughs> what happens is <laughs> it, it looks very much like a tree uh, structure. And in fact, it's very similar to your binary tree uh, from your data structure class. The only difference is uh, the fan out of each node is no longer two. The fan out is some parameter f. That's, that's typically much, much larger than two. Much, much larger than two. And that's the first difference. The second difference is every single node in your, in your B plus tree <coughs> is a this page. Is a disk page, so it corresponds to a page from your disk. Every node corresponds to a disk, so a disk page. Node corresponds to a disk page. And the third observation is the leaf level pages. You mean, I mean the pages at the bottom of your tree structure. They contain your data entries. So leaf level. Essentially, it's your data address. And that's it. That's the way you understand a B plus tree. And other than that, it's, it's the same as your binary tree. It's the same as your binary tree. In other words, what's going on here is in the leaf level pages, it contains all your data entries. And you may need more than, likely, you're going to need more than one page for your data entries. Right, because you have a large number of data trees that cannot possibly fit in just a single page, so you're gonna need multiple pages for that. Right? You're gonna need multiple pages for that. And since it is very like very much like a binary tree, which means the leaf level data trees are sorted. So you sort your data entries by the third key field. Okay? You follow me? And then you build a Binary tree with fan out f on top of this leaf level pages. Okay? And you ensure that each node in your tree <coughs> occupies a single this page. And actually, because of that, you can actually figure out this value f, the fan out of the page. The fan out of the page essentially is how many nodes in the next level are indexed? So the binary tree is found out equal to two. Why? Because the binary tree is called a binary tree because the found out is two, right? It's binary, right? So like this. So if you look at each single node, and if I enlarge this node, my found out is two. I index two nodes from the level below. And so my found out is two in this case. Okay. But in B plus three, since each node is a this page, is a this page, this gonna hold many many more entries than a single value, right? If you think about a binary tree, what happened? Let's say I put seventeen here. What's going on here is I can view this as seventeen with the pointer, which is this left pointer. I read this as greater than, and then this point as less equal than, which is this point. But that's the way I'm going to understand my uh, binary tree. You follow me? 
And I'm going to argue that this is what I call an index entry. And now you know each binary tree, every node in your binary tree simply contains a single index entry. Plus another pointer. Plus another pointer. What about in a B plus tree? Well, in a B, B plus tree, uh, an index page, a node, going to contain more than one index entry. Why? Because my page size is much bigger. It's much bigger. So I'm going to contain, for example, M, M index entries, M index entries. And every index entry is the format of a third key value of K plus a pointer. Very much like your binary tree. Very much like your binary tree. But I'm going to have multiple such entries rather than a single entry. You follow me? So I'm going to have multiple such entries plus the leftmost pointer, that pointer is going to still be there. This is, this is the same as your binary tree. So my find out for this particular node is what? It's simply m plus 1. Right? My find out in this particular case is simply m plus 1. That's the number of nodes I can index from the level below, which is the number of index entries you have plus 1, right? Plus that leftmost pointer you have. You want me? So let's give you a concrete example. <coughs> so in this case, <coughs> so I think there is a type over here. Okay. So let's say that's my uh, B plus three, and what's gonna happen is, so these are my leaf level pages, and they contain what I call earlier data entries, right? What I said earlier data entries. So this is the data entry, this is the data entry, and so on and so forth. And in this particular case, all third key, uh, let's assume we are using alternative two. That's assuming we are using alternative two, which means every array state in my data entry corresponds to a single record. You can understand that as the record ID. So what's going on is there is another level down below, which is my data file containing uh, the actual record, which I have ignored from this picture right here. You follow me? Okay. There is a data file down below, such that these are pointers to the record in that data file, which I have ignored from this picture. Okay. Now. Each of this is a page, a this page. Uh, for illustration purpose, I'm using a really small this page, right? E so basically, each page holds up to four entries. In reality, obviously, this is not going to be the case, right? Each page is going to hold m many more entries, right? Because why we can calculate the size of each data entry? Suppose this is the integer value, and RID, I view that as another integer value. Uh, <coughs> Each integer byte, I assume, is four bytes. Then each data entry is only eight bytes. Okay, so I'm using a really teeny tiny page here, which is only thirty-two bytes uh, for each page, because each entry is eight bytes, and I store four entries a page, which means my page size is only thirty-two bytes. In practice, your page size is much bigger than that, like eight kilobytes or sixteen kilobytes or at least four kilobytes in today's system. Okay. But nevertheless, let's use a 32 byte page for an uh, illustration. So I'm going to have four entries per page. Okay, that's my leaf level pages. And you notice that the data entries are sorted by the third key field. Yeah? Any question on this? Now, the question is how do you build the level above? Well, the level above is constructed in almost exactly the same manner as you have done in a binary tree, except that each node now has more than one entry compared to a binary tree. <coughs> okay? What that means is, <coughs> okay, what you, what you gotta do is you take the first entry out from each leaf level page. Let's ignore the first page for now. 
So I take the first entry out. Then I push up to the level above. And those key values become my values in the level above to index the nodes down below. You may wonder, OK, so 5 goes up. What about 14? Why the above value is 13, uh, not, uh, not 14? The reason is B plus 3 is a dynamic structure. That's how you do it at the beginning. Then later on, you may have deletion and insertion. So initially, I, have, I may have a 13, a data entry 13 here, which got deleted. That's why I say 13 there, but only 14 at the leaf level. But in general, you just understand this as a binary tree structure, where the value in the level above simply tells you where to go in the level below. Except that now instead of only having one entry, I have multiple entries in the level above. That's all. Okay. So for for this example, five and this quarter is one entry. Thirteen and that quarter is another entry. Twenty-seven and this quarter is one entry. Thirty and that quarter is a yet another entry. So I have four entries in total on the level above. Is that clear? So one question arises is how many entries you're gonna have in a level that's above the current level? How many entries you're gonna have in the level above the current level? Well, roughly speaking, you're gonna have if you have let's say you, if you have x number of pages in the current level, roughly you will have x number of index entries in the level above one entry per page from the current level, except that every so often you will skip an entry from level above. Why? Because you will have that leftmost pointer to use, to index a page from the current level. Oh, well, give you an example, right? This corresponds to an entry above, this corresponds to an entry above. Why this does not correspond to an entry above? Because you have the leftmost pointer to use for this. Now, coming to this page, you do not have to produce the entry for this because there is a leftmost pointer you can use. But once you have used that leftmost pointer, this will correspond to an entry above, this will correspond to an entry above. So roughly, for x number of pages, you're going to have x number of entries above. If you want to be precise, if you know the find out uh, the level above, roughly how many entries you have in the level above, roughly this number of entries. Right? Why? Because every f of pages, you're going to skip one entry. Suppose the average find out of a page is f. You follow me? On average, every f number of pages in the current level, you will skip one index entry from the level above. <coughs> you initially have this many entries in total, but you do not have to produce an index entry for roughly this many pages from the current level. So that's the total level of entries in the level above, roughly speaking. You follow me? Question on this? Okay, good. So you do this recursively until you have only one page left. You stop. And that's you what we call the root page. And that's essentially your root page of, of the B pass tree. Okay. Now how do you use this tree, right? How do you use this tree? Well, the way you use this tree to retrieve records is very much similar to what you do using a binary tree, right? You load the root page first. Once you load the root page to your buffer, you have access to all the data, uh, sorry, all the index entries from that page for free. Free means that they incur no more IOs for you because the entire page now is in the buffer. And you take the third key value of your query and compare that against the entries from the current page, and that all to give you one pointer you can follow down to the next level. One and only one. Because it's a sorted field, right? You can only go down by one pointer. And you follow the pointer, retrieve the page from the level below, and pin that page to the buffer, and you do that recursively. Until you reach the leaf level, you follow me? Once you reach the leaf level, you find the data entry correspond to your query and find the data entry correspond to the third key value in your query and use that data entry 
eventually to retrieve the record you want to look for. Okay, so so that's a very effective way, very uh, effective way of doing search. <coughs> and lastly, <coughs> the pages at the leaf level are linked to each other. The reason we do that is to support efficient uh, range query search. To support efficient range query search. If you think about range query, right? For example, find all records with GPA value greater than 3.0. How would you do that? Well, you use 3.0 as a search key value to go down the tree to find the first data entry that corresponds to a value 3.0. If you do not link the leaf level pages, you have to go back to the root of the tree again and search for the next record. But if you do link the pages in the leaf level, once you find the first data entry that corresponds to 3.0, you can do linear scan at leaf level because they are linked. And they are sorted. You follow me? So that's why we always link list uh, the leaf level pages together. So you can run through these examples quickly, right? For example, find 28 star. How do you do that? You load the root page, <coughs> 17, 28, you should go to right. So you load this page, then 27, 30, you should uh, follow the pointer in the middle. So you load this page. And once you load this page, you know 28 does not exist in my database. Okay? But for 29, I this time is in this page. So I should return ID this way, this entry. Okay? And this pointer, you can imagine that's kind of like an RID linked to the record itself. What about a rich search? Greater than 15 and less than 30. Well, greater than 15, I should come down here and come down here. And to this page, once I'm at this page, I can find the first data entry that's within my range, which is this entry. But from here, I can do linear scan all the way to where? Where can you stop? You cannot stop right here. Because by looking at this value, you are not sure whether the next value is outside your range or not. So you do have to go to the next page to verify that it is outside my range. Then you can stop. You follow me? Okay. So, so that's essentially a quick uh, overview of the Okay. Now, <laughs> so that's that's the basics of uh, leaf plus tree, and that's in general what we call tree-based indexing structure. Then there's another indexing structure, what we call hash-based indexing structure. The difference between hash-based indexing structure and tree-based indexing structure is the way you organize these data entries. It goes, goes with how you organize these data entries. If you look at a tree-based indexing structure, what we do is we sort the data entries then we build a binary tree-like structure on top, except that sum out is F and each node is a this page. Okay? What about a hash-based indexing structure? Well, the first step is identical to a tree-based indexing structure in the sense that you also get the data entries ready. You, you build the data entries, one for each record, if you are using alternative two. Suppose we are using alternative two for now. Okay? <laughs> you have one data entry for each record. You build that. But for a hash indexing structure, you do not sort the data entries. Rather, what do you do? You hash these data entries into different hash buckets. I'm going to draw this out on the chalkboard. <laughs> so what happens now is I'm going to have a collection of data entries. Okay, 
why this is a good hash function, I will come back uh, later on on this subject. It actually deserves some uh, discussion. There are some interesting observations on, on this hash function. I will come back later on when we go into the details of hash space index. Now I just give you an overview and if I take this uh, as input, right? So I just supply a hash function like this to you. Okay, what happens now is I'm gonna build a hash indexing structure where I started off, let's say I bought So what, which means I'm going to have B buckets in my hash indexing structure. Okay, B buckets. So the output is from, so this is the bucket 0 all the way to bucket B minus 1. Right? Initially, they are all empty, right? Initially, they are all empty. And each of this, you can view them as a single disk page. Each of them is a single disk page. Good morning. And what you do is you basically submit these guys to this hash function one by one. And you hash this, this X as you. You apply the hash function over the third key value on those data entries one by one. And that tells you where this data entry should go to on the output side. So the first one might go here, and the second one might go here, and the third one might go here, and the fourth one might go here. Right? Each of these is simply a data entry. Right? Eventually, what happens? At some point, some part is going to become full. Right? So what do you do? You introduce overflow pages. This is what I call overflow page. You follow me? That finishes the construction of your hash space indexing structure. Essentially, you hash the data entries into different buckets and allocate overflow pages when necessary. That's it. You follow me? So at the end of the day, the, the picture of it looks like this. So put this overflow by two, and this overflow by one. But the others, they are just one. They do not have overflow pages. Then this whole thing becomes you a hash space indexing structure. OK? So why this is useful, by the way? Well, this is useful because you can do equality search much more effectively compared to a tree-based indexing structure. Think about equality search in tree-based indexing structure. What you have to do is start from the root page and go down like that. And effectively, you need to look at one page from each level. One page at each level. So the cost of your search for equality search is roughly the height of the tree. The header tree. And the header tree typically is three or four, or even five, right? What about doing equality search using a hash indexing structure? Well, if you're lucky, you hash the third key value into a bucket that does not have overflow pages, you are done with a single IO. You follow me? Of course, you may argue what happened if I'm unlucky? You hash me into a bucket with a long list of overflow pages. In the worst case, what will be the worst case, by the way, for hash indexing structure? Can someone help me? One plus the one plus the the all of points. One bucket has all the points. One one bucket has all of all of the list. So everyone goes to the same bucket. Is that what you're saying? Uh, so I, I'm saying the <laughs> worst case is that um, it, it, can, it can be the end point of the list. The end point of the, the, list. Point of the list. Well, that's fine, but if my list is short, let's say my list is only two pages. Yes, it's in my end list. 
I know my least, but two IOs, still better than a tree structure. So what is, real, what is the real worst case? Nightmare. So what you describe is a bad case. What, what is the nightmare for you? Johnson a range selection? Uh, let's focus on range selection is bad, but let's focus on all right. Everybody maps the same bucket and every page yeah, is on the same go. bucket. All of these folks, all of these guys, for some reason, they uh, hash to the same bucket. So you have one bucket that has really long list and all the other bucket is effectively empty. Right? That's essentially the worst case, right? If you do ecology search using this, no matter what's your search key value, you're gonna end up here. Of course, for any search key value that in your database, maybe there's a search key value that's not from here hash to another market. But in that case, it's just an empty market. Let's assume you are searching for uh, existing records. So you guarantee that that search key value will end up here. Because why? Because you have tested. So you end up here, you do end up here. So if you search for that value, you're gonna end up here. <coughs> And what do you do? You have to uh, list through this list, right? Why? Because for ecology search, unless I tell you there's only one matching record, you can stop as quickly as you find one matching data entry. If you don't know how many matching data entries you have, you have to what? Scan through the list, go all the way to the end to make sure there's no uh, false negative. Or you can sort your data entry within this list. Yes, you can do that. But what happens if your uh, search key value just happens to be the biggest value that end up in the last page in your list? You have to go all the way to the end. Of course, you can argue this is still more efficient than searching through the data file itself. Why? Can someone make a case for me for that? Yes, but why? Yes, why did it feel more efficient? <laughs> well, what's your name? Abi. Sorry? Abi. Abi. Okay, so he said because data trees are smaller. Yes? And one more step ahead of that is because data trees are smaller, for the same number of data trees and same number of records are going to use much less number of pages to store this data entries. Which means the number of pages I need to scan is going to be much smaller than scanning through all the pages for my records. Do you want me? Right. So even in the worst case, using a hash index still saves me time compared to scanning through uh, <coughs> all the pages to search for a record. But it's going to be much more expensive than using a tree-based indexing structure in this case. What this discussion tells us is it's really important to have a good hash function. So I'll give you some example, right? Let's say I have the entire US population I want to index. So I'm going to have an index, a, a data entry for each one of you and every other person from the United States. Okay? And my hash function, I design a hash function, my hash function is what? My hash function is on the country of citizenship. And what's going to happen? And that's a bad hash function. Because for my data set, all of, all of us are from the United States, we're going to end up in the same bucket. For that example, that's a really bad hash function, right? However, in another example, if you're talking about Olympic Games, and you want to index all the assets from different uh, participating countries, then the same hash functions magically become a good hash function. Do you follow me? What that tells you is, what is a good hash function, what is a bad hash function, really depends on uh, your data distribution, your data distribution, right? So later on, I'm gonna have a discussion on how do you design good hash function and how to avoid bad hash functions. Okay. But for now, 
we understand what is the hash space index. Okay? Okay, good. <laughs> now we are ready to talk about cluster index and uncluster index. Okay? Cluster index and uncluster index. So strictly speaking, <coughs> cluster index and uncluster index only apply for now, let's, let's consider only tree-based indexing structure. Let's only consider tree-based indexing structure. And in that case, a cluster index is what is on the left, and what's the uncluster uh, uncluster index is what's on the right. So what is a cluster index? As you can tell from here, the records are sorted, the blue rectangle box, this denotes Pages from your data file containing records. So this is my data file. This data file, in this particular case, is essentially a sorted file. Why? Because the records are sorted in the same order as your data entries. In the same order as your data entries. And that's why the pointers from the data entries to the record, they do not cross over each other because they are sorted exactly in the same order. What about an unclass index? Well, an unclass index is exactly the opposite. Data entries are always sorted, but records may not be. Right? Records may be in a heap file, which is not sorted at all. So an unclass index is where is a is an index where data entries are sorted, but records are not. At least records are not sorted in the same order as your data entries. It could be that the records are sorted by age, but my Data entries search key value is on name. So I sort data entry by name, but your record is sorted by age. That's still considered as an unclustered index. You follow me? So you may wonder, okay, fine, I understand the difference between the two, but why we bother to make the distinction of the two? Well, it makes a huge difference in your query cost, right? If you try to search for data entries, then an unclassed index and a clustered index are identical. If you try to search for data entries, why? Because they all go to the brown level, the brown boxes, and they stop. They never look at the records themselves. You never bother to go to the blue box. But if your goal is to search for records rather than the data entries, then there is a huge difference. If you do a rich search of all records, satisfying some query condition on the search key value, Using a class index, you go down all the way, find the first record with the value in your range, then you can do linear scan right here. Can you do that here? You cannot, because you, you find the first data entry in your range, follow the pointer, find the record. You have to come back up, find the next data entry, come down again, come back. You have to do this up and down all the time, which is way more expensive than this. Two miles. Much more expensive. If you have, for example, 1,000 data entries in your query range, the IOs here is 1,000 plus some additional ones. At least one IO per data entry. What about here? Well, 1,000 entries means 1,000 records. 1,000 records may well reside in just a few pages. So you are, look at, you are looking at a huge difference. Last one before I let you go, I just want to conclude the class by telling you what is a cluster file. A cluster file A cluster file is a cluster index using alternative one. A cluster index using alternative one, which means what happens is there's no round boxes here because your data entries are your records. And it's a cluster index. A cluster file must be a cluster index, which means, it simply means records are sorted. Which, in other words, means your, your data entries are sorted. Because in alternative one, your data entry and record are the same thing. So they are sorted, and there's no particular level for your data entries, because they are simply your records. Your data file is your leaf level pages. If you remove, simply remove this level, this becomes your classifier. Okay? With that, I stop right here. We will continue our search. Today.